Oh yes, have I got a good one for you today. We are talking about this amazing thing, the Cavity Magnetron. And this story is going to take us from the dark depths of World War II all the way to the humble baked bean. These things are pretty rare to see in the wild, but this is a This Museum Is Not Obsolete video. So, of course, we have two of them. This one over here is my own personal 1940s cavity magnetron because they're so cool. I had to have one. Everybody needs their own personal cavity magnetron from 1940, right? What else am I going to do on a Friday night apart from look for old radar valves on eBay? The cool thing about this one, though, let me show you, is it's actually been cut open on the back so you can see all of the inside sides and we're going to talk about how this works which is pretty mind-bogglingly amazing and all the stories behind how it was used. Let us know if you want us to do more videos on the second world war tech that we have in the museum like this beautiful transmitter and receiver used in aircraft like the de Havilland Mosquito and Avro Lancaster. We've got an aerial reconnaissance camera and a radar screen as well. That's what these cavity magnetrons were used for, radar. Before electronic radar they actually used these big amazing concrete uh, dishes to try and pick up reflected sound coming across the channel to warn about bomber raids coming over. There's a load of those in Dungeon S, which is not far from here, so you can go and see those when you come and visit us here at the museum. But moving into the radio era, the first types of uh, radar were absolutely massive on big pylons, and you couldn't take them anywhere, and they used long wavelengths, so you didn't get much detail. At the time, the big problem was those pesky U boats. Uh, sinking all of our shipping in the Atlantic. Uh, so there had to be a solution found to make radar transportable so you could put it on an airplane, find the submarines and sink them. This thing is an oscillator, just like you have in all the synthesizers we have in the museum. The difference is this thing oscillates at way higher frequencies than humans can hear. So when something's oscillating, that just means it's going between two different things. That could be a speaker going between in and out and making a pressure wave in the air. And humans hear up to about 20 kilohertz. That's 20,000 oscillations per second. The amount of oscillations per second equals the pitch of the sound. Our cavity magnetron though uh, oscillates much faster than speakers do. This is oscillating at about 3.3 gigahertz and it's not outputting pressure waves in the air, it's outputting electromagnetic radiation. Radar works by sending out those oscillations, those waves, and then listening for the reflections coming back. The cavity magnetron didn't come out of nowhere, it came from a long development of amazing devices which were invented and discovered all around the world. But the big breakthrough came from John Randall and Harry Boot at Birmingham University. And the name of the cavity magnetron comes from the fact that you're using magnetic fields to steer the path of electrons, magnetron, yeah? And inside it has a load of resonant cavities. It looks like the cylinder of a revolver and in fact in the prototype stage they used the jigs from Colt revolvers to manufacture these. So now you can put radar on an airplane and hunt down those U-boat wolf packs and you can do that in all weathers and at night and that's important because those U-boats had to surface to replenish their air supply and charge the batteries and they used to do that under the cover of darkness. So now now you can fly over and find them. And this is really important. We were importing a lot of vital things like food and war supplies from all the way around the world. And the U-boats posed a pretty big threat. When one of these got sent to the States, James Finney Baxter from the Office of Scientific Research and Development said it was the most valuable cargo ever to reach US shores. And they were so worried about this tech falling into enemy hands that until 1943, planes carrying a cavity magnet Magnetron were only allowed to fly sorties over the sea just in case they were shot down. These things are vacuum tubes, us Brits call them valves, and we've got quite a few vacuum tubes in the museum. 
These things are pretty cool. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and they were used in every type of electronic device uh, before the invention of transistors. These thyrotrons were used as part of a bigger radar system. You can see how huge they are. The reason why you suck all the air out and make a vacuum is because these things are particle accelerators. So you have two electrodes, a cathode and an anode. And because electrons are negatively charged, they get pulled like a magnet towards the anode. Anode. And if you have loads of air in the gap between them, they can't get through because they're colliding with all of those molecules. So you suck the air out, make a vacuum, and the electrons can jump across. Then the next step is to introduce different types of electrodes in the middle, in the gap, and they can control the flow between the cathode and the anode. That's how you make things like amplifiers, which means that we could have things like the Beatles and allow us to make loads of amazing stuff. And this was the only way that they could do things for a long time until the transistor was invented. Some tubes like these Nixie tubes only have partial vacuums inside and you're intentionally colliding particles together to release energy. And you see the photons as light. Filling the tubes with different gases gives different colour light. This neon is a nice orangey glow. Argon makes a lovely purple. You can see in the middle here, that is the cathode. It runs all the way through the core of it. And that is heated because if you put a bit more energy into the molecules on the cathode, the electrons are more likely to be able to jump off towards the anode, which is all the way around here, made out of this big piece of copper with all of the cavities drilled into it. So electrons are jumping from the cathode in the middle over the interaction space uh, into the anode. And the amazing thing, and the reason why it's called a magnetron, is because you can steer the path of those electrons as they're travelling through the interaction space. And you do that with a magnetic field. And that's how cathode ray tubes in old TVs work. You've got an electron gun here which shoots electrons all the way to this phosphor coated screen here. The phosphor glows in a visible light spectrum for humans when electrons hit it. And you can wrap around this tube an electromagnet and use that to steer the path of the electrons uh, to a position on the screen, like an etcher sketch. And if you move it fast enough, our persistence of vision tricks us into believing that there is an image on the screen. The magnetic field in a cavity magnetron actually makes the electrons spiral around inside this interaction space. This idea was taken from an earlier device called a cyclotron. Eventually though, after cycling around a bit, the electrons will hit the wall of this anode and you will get a slightly more negatively charged region. And so now, you have slight voltage differences within the anode itself, and that creates current flow, an electrical current flow, as all those differently charged regions try to even out. The genius thing is because of the cavities, it takes more time for those little charge fluctuations to even out. That's because the current has to flow around the cavities yeah and you can actually tune the amount of time uh, therefore the wavelength that this thing outputs by the size of those cavities and so because of that time delay and the random stream of electrons constantly smashing into the anode and their path being uh, deflected and influenced by the fluctuating currents and charges within the anode itself you have this amazing uh, spiraling oscillating wave within this thing in fact there was a chap called percy spencer who was an engineer working on some radar technology and he noticed one day that the chocolate bar in his pocket had melted uh, so he did a few more experiments he put some popcorn kernels next to the radar device they started popping and at that point I would have started to get a bit worried but all ended well because he had in fact invented the microwave oven you can tune the cavities in here so that they emit the wavelength that resonates with water molecules that jiggles them about heats them up and that's how your food cooks in the microwave there is a little experiment you can do at home at your own risk I hasten to add, uh, to demonstrate the power of these resonating microwaves uh, where you put two uh, grapes together and they vibrate and uh, resonate 
and create a plasma in between them. I'd give that a go, it's quite fun. What are you doing? Just making plasma in the microwave, honey. Let us know how you got on in your fruit-based scientific experiments. Let us know if there was anything else in the video that you want us to do more videos on. Let us know uh, what your favorite thing to cook in the microwave is. Is it these beans? Uh, <laughs> do you even have beans in your country? Um, I mean, if you have a, such a sophisticated palate as the uh, residents of the UK do, you definitely know what beans are. Are. Um, and so uh, if you've been inspired by this video, you can uh, see all of the other videos that we've got on the channel already. You can also come and visit us in person. We've got loads of cool stuff around in the area, like those sound mirrors in Dungeness. Come for a nice seaside holiday. Uh, just on a short hop down on the train from London, we're based in Ramsgate in Kent. Uh, so you can also support us by clicking on the Patreon link down below in the description. Uh, that will take you through to loads of extra bonus content not publicly available on the YouTube and uh, also free downloads of all the sample packs that we've made. Uh, these are recordings of all the things around the museum. We've got synthesizers, we've got drum machines, we've got clicks and clacks from uh, telephone exchanges. You can cut these up and make beats and make awesome music. You can also book out of hours recording sessions so you can have free reign of everything around the museum, including this beautiful wall of Brulin Cure test equipment. If you want to make a one-off donation to the museum, then you can click on the PayPal link below. There's also YouTube super thanks and buy me a coffee. Catch you in the next video.